Thank you so much, Cameron, and thank you everyone for joining us today for the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar, Finding the Way in Dementia Care, Use of Care Navigators for People Living with Dementia and Their Caregivers. The National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series is supported by the Administration for Community Living. Before we get started, I will turn it over to Erin Long from the Administration for Community Living for a brief welcome. Erin? Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, join us for our webinar today. It's an extremely timely and important topic that we're looking forward to hearing from Michelle Johnston uh, from the state of California and Burke Bryson from OCCK in Kansas. I want to thank both of them for taking the time to put these presentations together and for sharing their experiences with us. And with that, I'm going to give it back to you, Sari, so we can get started. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Erin. I will introduce both our presenters and then we'll get started. As you heard, today's presenters are Michelle Johnston and Brooke Bryson. Michelle Johnston is our first presenter today. After 11 years with the Alzheimer's Association, Michelle joined the California Department of Aging in 2022 as program director for their dementia initiatives. Michelle has over 25 years of community health and organizational development experience. She has also been a caregiver to multiple family members who faced chronic health issues, including her father who had dementia related to Parkinson's disease. Our second speaker today is Brooke Bryson, who has worked in the advocacy arena for 25 years, supporting individuals with systems with systems of poverty, domestic violence, sexual assault, addiction, and health care. Currently, much of Brooke's time is spent in direct service, serving people living with dementia, including those with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Brooke provides crisis management, connection to local and rural resources, and disease education. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Michelle Johnston to begin. Michelle? Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to be talking about our CALS Connect program, so you can take it to the next slide. And so this project is um, funded by the Administration on Community Living. It's a cooperative agreement to the California Department of Aging as part of their Alzheimer's Disease Program Initiative grant for state entities. Um, we started this grant back in September of 2022, and we'll be continuing on through August of 2025. And we greatly appreciate ACL's support in this project. And I'm going to be sharing a bit about how community health workers in three counties um, are planning to provide dementia care navigation using a no wrong door approach. Next slide, please. So this program when we're offering, when we're developing the proposal, the California Department of Aging team looked at the different evidence-based models around dementia care and selected the Care Ecosystem Program. Care Ecosystem was developed by UC San Francisco and our team selected it because for a few different reasons. One is that the support is provided by telephone so this makes it more accessible for individuals in rural and remote areas. It also helps reduce barriers to access for marginalized groups such as transportation or language access. It's a comparatively low cost intervention since it uses allied health professionals instead of licensed personnel. And this helps us to address California's current workforce issues um, and also the mounting um, financial pressures on payers to manage the growing population of people living with dementia. And then as we looked at the projected demand in our state um, for the future, it's a practical, it's practical application, makes it more scalable and replicable statewide. We also um, are using home meds, which is another evidence-based tool um, that will help us identify the potential um, patient medication related hazards. We're offering this service both to the persons with dementia as well as their caregivers that we're working with. Um, because often caregivers have their own medication issues. And so the Home Meds program was developed by Partners in Care Foundation, and it involves a pharmacist consult and recommendations where the system flags potential issues. And this is important for us because our program is not based in a healthcare system. Next slide, please. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about Care Ecosystem and kind of the core components of that. Um, just to give a little background for anyone who might not be familiar with it, since it's um, the program that um, our site and Brooks site are both using. Um, as I mentioned, it's an evidence-based model. It was developed by UC San Francisco and inv involves a multidisciplinary team. So if you look at the diagram on the right, you'll see in that yellow circle, 
Um, there's the person with dementia and caregiver, and that's our dyad for the program. So the caregiver can be a family member, a friend, or even a paid staff member who supports that person with dementia and who's willing to participate in the regular contacts with the program. Um, care ecosystem has been shown to improve caregiver well-being as well as quality of life for the person living with dementia. It's also been shown to reduce emergency department visits, potential inappropriate medication use, and the total cost of care based on Medicare claims data. So it has good, good evidence background. The um, care team navigator, and in our project, as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, we're using um, community health workers in that role. The care team navigator builds rapport with the dyad. They learn more about their situation, so their living situation, their stories, their values, their preferences, what resources they have access to. And then that person helps to personalize care to actively support the dyad and to empower the caregiver to be an advocate for the person living with dementia. They provide support, linkages to community-based resources, resources on topics such as advanced care planning, as well as care coordination. And then that care team navigator is connected to the clinical team, which is that um, kind of blue lump at the bottom. And those are individuals with dementia expertise. It typically involves nursing, social work, and pharmacy support. This multidisciplinary team meets frequently with the care team navigators so they can discuss cases and they're available for consultation outside of the meetings as well. And then up in the top left, that green circle is community resources. So our teams are continually updating and expanding shared resources that they can use, um, vetted caregiver educational information. Um, UC San Francisco, I'll show at the end of my presentation the link to their website for their resources. They have a lot of great caregiver educational resources um, in both English and now a growing Spanish library as well. Um, and then our local partners who are involved in the project also have those databases for their referrals. And then the top right, the healthcare providers. Um, a lot of care ecosystem um, sites are embedded within health systems. Um, ours is not, it's more of a community-based model. So what we're doing is encouraging the dyads to reach out to their healthcare providers as needed. Um, and care ecosystem has a number of evidence-based protocols. So on the left are the protocol topics. Um, and these are designed to support the person living with dementia and the needs of the caregivers. Um, this model is really a person-centered customized model. So while these protocol topics exist, the resources are provided on an as-needed basis on depending on what the dyad's current situation is and their needs and interests. It's not necessarily a prescribed order. So you can see it starts out with what their immediate needs are. And then depending on what they're looking for, there are topics around COVID and disasters and related events. Um, medication reconciliation and review, that's where we're using home meds, um, safety screenings and recommendations, resources, referrals, and education, caregiver well-being, behavior management, and advanced care planning. Next slide, please. So next, I'm going to talk about who's involved in our project. So um, the California Department of Aging, we are the grant recipient. And then we're working with three pilot counties. Um, and each of these are agencies who serve older adults or, and or people with disabilities through either a designated or a developing Aging and Disability Resource Connection Program, or ADRC. So we have two that are embedded within the area agencies on aging, that's Imperial and, Marin, and Ventura County, sorry. And then Marin County is within their Center for Independent Living. And then um, these sites were selected um, for the strength of their existing programs as well as for their geographic diversity. So you can see they represent Northern, Central, and Southern California as we define it, um, including rural communities. And in choosing the counties, we looked at factors such as the size and diversity of the older adult population, um, the prevalence of Alzheimer's, and the percent of older adults who were Medi-Cal eligible. Um, so Imperial County, that's the county on the bottom right, and they actually, some data that came out last year showed that they have the ninth highest Alzheimer's prevalence of any county in the United States. And that was published in the Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal. So it's really important that we, um, you know, be able to make, have a presence and provide support in that county. By utilizing the Aging and Disability Resource Connection programs, this approach will help provide streamlined access um, to dementia care information and supports within a community hub that's already offering resource navigation, assistance, and care planning. 
So the nice thing about it is if there are folks who are ineligible for our program for one reason or another, um, the ADR staff can direct them to other resources in the community. And since this program is based in a community organization versus a health system, we're contracting with some partners to provide the clinical support team. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about their role in a later slide, but just to let you know who they are, it's Partners in Care Foundation is providing home meds and our nurse for the project. And then Alzheimer's Los Angeles is providing our social worker. And our evaluator on this effort is the GIGAS group. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we chose to hire community health workers to serve as the care team navigators within the care ecosystem model. And there are a few reasons for that. And so when you look at um, the American Public Health Association's definition of what a community health worker is, it's that frontline public health worker. It's someone who's a trusted member of the community and or has a close understanding of that community. They can serve as a link to facilitate access to services. They can help improve quality and cultural competence of service delivery and build the capacity of individuals and their community. And so the role of a community health worker fit very nicely with the competencies and roles that were defined within the care ecosystem model for the care team navigator. Um, and we feel like community health worker is a term that um, it's a little more commonly used in the community. So it might be something that's a little more familiar to folks. Um, so that's um, the term that we're using and the type of individual that we're hiring for that. So next slide. We have a, another reason for why we're using community health workers um, and we believe that it offers us some potential for sustainability, both at the state and the federal level. And so in California, Medi-Cal is our version of Medicaid. And in 2022, um, we, the state launched a community health worker benefit. So community health workers can provide preventive services on the written recommendation of a licensed practitioner. They can address issues that include things such as control or of chronic conditions, including those related to aging. Um, and the community health worker can assist in developing a plan of care with the licensed provider, and they can be supervised by a community-based organization or local health jurisdiction, such as a public health department, that doesn't necessarily have a licensed provider on staff. So as community health workers are starting to be integrated into care teams throughout the state, we feel like this offers an opportunity for us to be able to possibly continue this program um, beyond the life of this grant. Next slide. And then for those of you um, in any state in the United States, um, Medicare has also been rolling out a community health worker benefit, which offers another opportunity around sustainability. Now, I'm not an insurance expert, um, but I did want to highlight these opportunities to use care, community health workers or care team navigators. Um, and it includes those who are working for an organization without a billing healthcare practitioner. So this provides some opportunities for some of our county departments and community based organizations. Um, it's similar in that it involves assessment and care coordination, education, health systems navigation, those types of things to help address unmet social determinants of health needs, to provide navigation for those with high risk conditions, which includes dementia, um, and the community health worker can work for a community based organization and then be supervised by the billing practitioner. And then for those of you familiar with the guide model that CMS is rolling out their new pilot. And that also offers an opportunity to partner with providers in the area who may be chosen for that. So we feel like there's a lot of um, excitement um, out there about using community health workers and helping to embed these folks within um, healthcare teams. And so we feel like it's good timing for us as we roll this out um, in our pilot. Next slide. So in terms of our planning process, um, so of course we secured the grant, we contracted with the partners um, and are updating our plans. Um, next slide. Should say planning process on the top. There we go. Um, and then setting up our systems and processes. So what's the system going to be for referral and enrollment and data collection? Um, and it's important to remember we're working with three different organizations in three different counties. Um, so we're not using kind of one process for everyone. They're embedding um, this effort within their existing processes and systems. So we've been working with each of them to figure out, okay, what works? How do you do these types of things in your organization and how do we add this program into it? Each county is hiring a community health worker, one full-time health worker, um, and they're recruiting people who are bilingual in English and Spanish. And then we've been working with the sites to embed the referral process into their existing information and assistance efforts. So the INA staff will be handling the initial screening and then connecting folks with the community health workers or referring them for other programs and services if they're not a good fit for this project. Care ecosystem, um, the program itself is free to use. UCSF has a great collection of resources. They have training videos and conversation protocols. 
um, resource materials for the dyads in English and Spanish. Um, and this has really made it easier for us to get started since a lot of those materials were already available. Um, UCSF also has a monthly meeting of existing care ecosystem sites where you can go and talk to other sites who've been maybe doing this longer and ask questions and say, hey, how are you dealing with this? You know, what's your caseload like? And really just get that information that has made it helpful for us as we've been getting started. We worked with our um, project partners. We've been meeting um, once or twice a month since we got the grant. Um, and so one of the things we did, we did was design the program flyer to use for their outreach efforts. And so we created kind of a template and then tailored it. Um, so each site has their own localized version in English and Spanish that they can share um, to help um, bring people into the program and, and make get the word out. Welcome. And then in our partner meetings, as well as some steering committee meetings we've been having with some outside experts, and we've been discussing like who they should reach out to and, and what good ways are to promote the program and encourage enrollment. So that's kind of our planning process. Next slide. And then um, we our sites have been working to get their health workers hired. So we have two sites that are up and running providing services. That's Marin and Ventura County. Um, we've been running into some um, hurdles around um, kind of process logistics and some um, illness that has um, slowed us down a little bit in Imperial County. So we don't have that site up and running yet. But um, the two for all three sites, what we did was we developed a sample job description. So we looked at the materials in the care ecosystem manual, the health worker job description that one of our sites had for a different project, and then looked at what information each of those um, organizations has to put in their job descriptions. And so we developed a sample looked at it through the partners, got feedback, and then that helped us so that each of them could take what they needed out of the sample job description to create the local one for their counties. Um, community health workers don't need to have college degrees or necessarily come to the job with a background in healthcare, but what really we're looking for are people with excellent communication skills um, and the ability to build rapport with the folks they're working with and um, to learn information quickly and to be able to find what they need. So information on Alzheimer's and other dementias, on caregiving, on the care ecosystem protocols, on our home meds program, on our data entry procedures. So there's definitely a lot for them to learn and a lot of support available to them. Um, folks who are good with problem solving. So they need to implement the protocols um, per the needs and wishes of the diet. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not a prescribed order. So it's what people are interested in and kind of what's come to the forefront for their, their family and that can help identify resources to address issues. And then folks who know when they need to escalate to our clinical support teams, for example, if there's a safety need. And then organized folks, right? So they're managing a caseload. The goal is to have about 50 dyads that they're working with at any one time. So scheduling, following up, ensuring they've got all the data entry in, um, organization skills are helpful. And then someone who can communicate with the dyads in their preferred language, which is why we hired folks who speak both English and Spanish. Next slide. And then in terms of the training, um, you know, depending on the community health worker skills and experience that they come, you know, bring when they come to their role, it can take a couple of months to train them so they feel ready to start enrolling their clients. So our social worker and nurse, who are the key part of our clinical support team, um, they designed and led most of the training for our program. Um, since our team is spread out all across the state, all of our training was virtual. And the social worker and nurse checked in with, the, with each trainee daily to review kind of what they'd done, answer any questions, provide additional training, and um, discuss their future activities and those types of things. So this list is um, a list of the topics that were covered during their training. So of course, since these folks are all embedded in a different organization, they all had tra some training required by their employer and that was managed locally. And then I did a training on the project background. Our evaluator did a training on the data collection system. We used the Care Ecosystem online training, which is a series of videos and quizzes. Um, and then our nurse and social worker provided additional background on Alzheimer's and related conditions and tools for caregivers. They reviewed all the Care Ecosystem materials with them. And there were some activities for the folks to learn more about local resources that would be helpful. And they are, were able to observe care consultations and support groups provided um, through the um, organization that our social worker is with. They did role plays. We gave them sample cases they had to pull resources for. They did the home meds training. Um, and then they had conversations about the scope of their role and escalations, you know, adult protective services reporting, appropriate boundaries, those types of, of um, topics. Next slide. 
And then implementation wise, um, we started in October of 2023. Um, we trained staff um, from each of the individual organizations. So two of the sites have launched. So those outreach staff have been trained and um, the information assistance staff have been trained. So they know what, how to, who's appropriate for the program and how to get them enrolled. Um, and then our community health workers, the goal is for them to enroll 240 dyads in each county over the two-year period. And they conduct regular calls with the dyads to assess their needs, provide education, make referrals, follow up on whether their needs have been met using the protocols and resource materials. They collect information for the home meds, medication reconciliation, um, as well as for the project evaluation, and then complete and up create and update care plans as needed. We currently have 23 dyads that we're working with. Um, we've completed the home meds assessment for seven people living with dementia. And of those seven home meds assessments, five of them had at least one alert that required a review and recommendations for them pharmacist. Next slide. All right. So in terms of ongoing monitoring and development, our clinical support team conducts weekly huddles with the community health workers for case reviews, ongoing professional development, and to raise and address issues. And we meet as a team, so both community health workers get to hear how things are going for each other and learn, learn from each other as well as from our clinical support staff. Uh, we'll be conducting training annually with the referral staff. Um, seem to have lost the slides. Um, the project team is going to meet one to two times per month to assess progress. Thank you. Discuss best practices, identify issues, and plan for sustainability. We have a steering committee that meets quarterly, and those include our project team members as well as some outside experts. So we've been tapping into their expertise and contacts um, throughout the, the implementation period. And then we're implementing the evaluation plan. We'll be providing reports every six months. For the referral staff, we initially conducted two trainings with the referral staff from each agency. And we held each training twice so that the staff would still be available to handle incoming calls and referrals that were coming into their organizations. So the first trainings were an overview on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias to make sure they all had a baseline level of, level of knowledge, and then also a training on the program and the referral process. Next slide. Um, and then in terms of care navigation examples, um, just to kind of give you a sense of what types of things we're working with folks on, um, one of our care um, community health workers is supporting a woman who had been separated from her husband for 15 years, but now recently has moved back in with him and his adult children um, to help care for him after he was diagnosed with dementia. Um, and so our community health worker is helping get them connected to an adult day health center and in home supportive services so that she doesn't have to provide all the care. Um, Another family, um, our um, community health worker had been talking with them about the benefit of daily routines and activities. Um, and the wife called back a few weeks later to let him know that she'd set up a routine. And one of the things they do is they go to their local community center and they play ping pong every day. And she talked about how having this routine has really benefited from her husband. And now he's starting to ask every day about when they're gonna go and play ping pong. So that's been, been a helpful um, support for them. And then um, the final one that I wanted to mention is just there was a caregiver whose father had been um, in the hospital. And while he was in there, he was prescribed an antipsychotic. Um, and then that medication was also sent home with them. And so she was really concerned about whether the prescription was needed and the impact it was having on her father. Um, so our community health worker did the medication reconciliation with them, provided some coaching around how to talk with their healthcare provider around the issues. And then also how to address some behavioral expressions that the father was having that were um, concerning for the family. Next slide. And just in terms of our early lessons. Um, so one of the things I would say is that it's difficult to try and launch a program simultaneously in three counties. Um, we had a great timeline that talked about how everybody was going to be trained at the same time, all the contracts would be signed at the same time. Um, and that's certainly not how it's worked in, these, in our um, different counties. So sometimes it depends on who you're contracting with. Um, government agencies, our contracts needed to be approved by the Board of Supervisors, had to get on their agendas, our nonprofit, it was a lot easier for them to get started more quickly. So while we would have liked to have trained all the community health workers at the same time, um, we've had to conduct most of the training individually. Um, in terms of data collection, um, it can be challenging to figure out the best solution related to data collection if everyone isn't already on the same system, which was the case for our folks. Everybody was using different systems with different levels of ability to tailor them. So we're using um, a separate um, data system for this project, which is not ideal for them, but is kind of what we're at at this time. 
it takes time and patience to ramp up enrollment. Um, I would have loved to have had, you know, 50 um, people enrolled in the program for each of our community health workers by the end of the first month, and we're not there yet. Um, but we are um, ramping up slowly and, and getting the word out in the community. Um, and so that um, we, we will get there, but it takes time and patience. Um, and on a positive note, I want to end with the remote clinical support can work. You know, I think sometimes people think, well, if you're not there and you're not seeing the person in person, can you still provide that support? Can you build that connection so they'll call you when something's going on? Um, and we've had great luck with that in our program. Next slide. So this is um, just so that when you get your slide deck, you'll have access to the um, website where UCSF has all of their care ecosystem materials. It's a fabulous resource. I mean, even if you're not implementing their program exactly, there are some tremendous resources out there around dementia care management, great training, great resource materials. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out. And then, oh, sorry, next slide. There we go. That's the UCSF materials. And then next slide. And that's it. So here's how you find me. Um, if you have questions about our program or any of the resources I've shared, um, definitely feel free to reach out um, after the session. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Brooke Bryson from OCCK, who's going to talk about their program. I'm Brooke Bryson, and I'm with OCCK's Alzheimer's program in Salina, Kansas. Next slide, please. So I want to begin by telling you a little bit about OCCK. We started 54 years ago as a way to um, provide services to those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, OCCK originally stood for Occupational Center of Central Kansas. We have outgrown that title. We're now known just as OCCK. Um, we currently provide services across the lifespan. So you can see there we have about 16 departments. Um, offering everything from transportation um, that's within the community as well as from town to town. Um, we have about 325 employees who serve about 4,500 people in 43 of the 105 Kansas counties. Next slide, please. So our Alzheimer's journey began in 2016. We partnered with Kansas University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center on a grant. Um, they created a collaboration between nonprofits and two universities to support families who were living with dementia or had intellectual or developmental disabilities and were at risk for dementia. It was a four-year program and we served 150 families and trained 200 care workers. We continued that partnership um, with the next grant for the National Institute on Aging. Um, it was increasing the social support and education networks. It also created an online presence for the organization. Um, next slide. We were encouraged then to do our own grant as OCCK. We again partnered with KU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center um, with OCCK being the lead. We had four objectives um, with this ACL grant and they were to establish extension offices um, in each of our areas to advance the referral pathways with our providers, to develop and use early recognition support tools for both our formal and informal, so our paid and non-paying caregivers, and build awareness among primary care practices about these tools and our program. Next slide. So this just gives you um, kind of an overview of the state of Kansas and what we're covering. I know there's a lot going on here. So in that yellow is our 18 core counties. We have two OCCK cognitive care navigators and we cover those 18 counties. You'll see the black oval in the center that says OCCK. That is our primary office in Salina. Then we have three satellite offices in three of our counties. We started out not only partnering with KU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which you can see off to the far right, um, but we also had partners in Western County. We were trying to reach you know, more of the Kansas area. And our further out Western Kansas providers were going to send referrals to KU. Um, and so KU, we had to pivot a little bit when we lost those partnerships. KU now covers our 200 mile radius from OCCK, where our cognitive care navigators at OCCK cover a hundred mile radius. And we are traveling to the homes as much as possible. Next slide. 
So Michelle did an excellent job of telling you all about the CARE ecosystem. I just want to quickly remind you of the four main things. They have a cognitive team navigator who connects with their medical team or their clinicians with dementia experience. There's a set of CARE protocols, and then there's a library of information that we add to with our local resources. Next slide. So we created our own adaptation. We did not want a medical model. We wanted a community-based model. So we don't start out with a clinical team. We build those connections as we need them. We also did a two-tier system. We have a community support facilitator who is local to the community, is known to the community, and creates that warm handoff to our navigator. And so they're that person that, the per that someone who's experiencing difficulties can go to and connect with. We also have then our care navigator who takes that referral, does rural outreach, and also connects with our intellectual and developmental disability population. We also provide for those who are living alone. And we had this great idea of having Zoom rooms to connect with people. We were going to have our community support facilitator have a local place where they can go to and connect with that navigator through a Zoom. They wouldn't have to know how to work any of the um, technology. Our support facilitator would do all of that for them and essentially would host that connection. What we found was that going to the individual was working better for us. Um, so we still use Zoom rooms, but not in the way we originally envisioned. Next slide. So our cognitive care navigator role, um, when we were going out and speaking to our senior centers, we wanted an easy way for people to understand why this was important and why a cognitive care navigator helped. So we started out by talking about effects of the disease and kind of the negatives of the disease. And you see those there in yellow. So when we're talking about the effects of the disease, the cognitive care navigator comes in and gives tips and techniques. If someone is experiencing isolation, this disease is very isolating, we provided socialization. If they are having extreme anxiety, we do brain health activities with them and kind of help with that anxiety. We give them something to do that's positive. If they were feeling powerless, we talked about the impact that being part of a research trial can do for them. If they're stressed out, we have resources and referrals. If they're feeling loss of rights, like loss of driving is a big one early on. We do a safety review and help them come to that conclusion themselves that maybe driving is not the best thing right now, but we're not making that decision for them. We give them the power to do it themselves. We also address their fears by providing knowledge and facts. And of course, we're addressing their grief by planning for the future and what may come. And essentially, we're there as support. Um, we're often referred to as the boots on the ground um, or the direct, direct support in a support role. Next slide, please. So the benefit of a care navigator for a person who's living with dementia, um, it's very empowering to have somebody there to talk to and to guide you. We find that we provide an environment of hope. We're giving meaningful and purposeful contact. We're taking their wishes and wants and making them first in our plan. We're providing targeted interaction based on what their likes are, what their needs are, and what their values are. We feel we expand their voice. We address their fears and worries. We adapt to their individual needs. And we provide them with the socialization. Next slide. So for the caregiver, we step in when they're needing emergency respite. So right now that is short term and as needed. Um, we're looking at a bigger respite program in the future. Right now we're providing a presence. We're modeling interaction for them. We provide possible answers and never say we have the answers because not everything works for every person. We try really hard to do the legwork and the research for them so that we're not handing them one more thing they have to do. Validation, reassurance, and reminding them that they are enough are probably our greatest outcome um, in this program. We also always try to find a way to guess. We find that our caregivers hear the word no a lot. Um, 
And so we try to find what they're really looking for and who can provide that or a way that we can relieve whatever it is that they are needing in that moment. Next slide. So the first action we have when we meet a family, a community member, or a medical provider is we have an information folder and we target the information folder to the interaction that we're having. So we have some basic information sheets, which are our brochures and flyers. Um, and then if we're meeting with a community member, we may have some fun facts or brain teasers in there for them to look at. For a family, we're going to look at the challenge specific information that they're dealing with. And for our medical providers, we try to put in any current trainings that are coming up. And as always, we provide local resource information. Next slide. So here you'll see some of the information that we put in the folder. Most important is always our contact sheet, which we made sure to have our name large enough to read to remind people that we are safe. It also has my picture. Again, if I'm showing up to your house and your caregiver is not there, it lets you know that I'm a safe person to come in. And then it has every possible way to contact me as well as why I'm there. And then we have the brochures that we created and two of our flyers about why screening is important. Next slide. So again, I mentioned that we don't start out with a medical team. We build the team as we need it. So as those referrals come in from agencies, the care partner, or even our community support facilitator, we keep our person living with dementia as our central focus. Um, the care team partner, the care partner, the CCN, and the person living with dementia become a very close team. And then we reach out to who do they need? Do they need respite services that they can hire? Or do we need church volunteers? Do we need home health services? We're looking at exactly what that person needs in building that team. Next slide. So one of our outreach things is we created from that pie chart, those different slices of our support wheel, um, we created the Slice, which is a quarterly newsletter that we send out each month. Um, my partner and I write articles based on those topics, and we mail it out not to the only to the individuals who are in our program, but also to any of our partnerships, any of our um, teams with in-house that we have, our staff, and we make sure that it becomes another way to educate individuals. Next slide. So again, like OCCK, your cognitive care navigator is more than you think. Their primary role is to bridge the gap between medical services and community resources. They reduce the stigma associated with dementia through community education, trainings, and screenings, and we're there to support both for the health of the individual living with dementia as well as the caregiver. Next slide. So these are some of the activities that we are currently doing. Um, we were able to reach out to a local senator. We've also been to the doctor's offices. Um, here's just one of the quotes. It says, I love her. The CCN helps us deal with issues in the kindest way. She is a positive and helpful person helping us to bridge the gaps. Next slide. This is our memory cafe. And I'll admit, I didn't know it was called a memory cafe when we started it. I had an individual who through COVID hadn't left the house in two years. Many of her friends had died during that period. And so I reached out to a local community religious organization who was hosting game days and they have crafting. They have a number of things to do within the community. And I said, can I bring this person and mention that she had dementia and that she needed to bring her husband with her? The problem was that the organization only hosts for individuals who are women or children. But what they did was they closed during their closed hours, offered us time to host our group. And so we built from there. They now provide us with lunch and once a month we meet and we have great socialization. Sometimes we do a project together. Sometimes it's just fun. Uh, so a couple of the quotes that I have here are, can we just clone the CCN? I have been so lucky to have access to them. They have been life-changing and life-saving. Another one, I felt like I was drowning. I couldn't keep my head above water. I don't know where I would be without the CCN. Next slide. So 
So some of our activities ended up being too much um, for our individuals who were living with dementia. They were great for the caregivers um, and they had a great time. Um, you can see here in this first picture, they're batting a balloon, uh, but the noise level got too high. So we have learned from that. We know to keep it a much calmer activity and we don't do such physical things anymore. So this quote says, very much appreciate the CCN. She gets stuff done. She makes him feel like he is her only client. We also had individuals, like I said, we try to individualize to their favorite activities. We have a number of men who have dementia, who have female caregivers, and they all decided they liked cars. Um, so I called up the local car club and we ended up having a mini car show um, during one of our lunch sessions. Um, it, it was great. It was fantastic. They got to go for rides or crawl in the cars and just had a great time. Our individuals with developmental disabilities um, really enjoy games and activities. And so we meet once a week and have activities with them as well. Um, so in that, there was a quote underneath and I'll let you read that. I seem to have lost my slides. Okay. So one of our other focuses is to provide trainings and we do that not only for our caregivers, but also for staff, community organizations, and for providers. And we try to target our trainings to their special needs. So this one, Cognitive Care Navigator, insights have helped me to better understand the progression of the disease and guide us in planning and identifying other resources we would need to provide care going forward. Next slide. I included these pictures because they were less than a month apart and I wanna welcome you to Kansas. We went from a luau to freezing. Um, so in the first one, we were having a great time talking to people. And the second one, we were only, only had people who were interested in getting the free coffee we were giving away because it was less than 30 degrees. So the quote here is an absolute lifesaver. We never be where we are on this journey without the CCN. They are always available. There is no number high enough to rate them. They explain things in a way that someone with no education and not well-versed can understand. So our community gatherings have been really important in making connections, not just with individuals, but also with our community partners. Next slide. We have screening day. So this was a group session. However, most of the time we do these individually. Um, where we'll do the screening with an individual, then go over their results and talk about next steps. Um, the quote, I think what you all provide is a much needed service. You need to triplicate the CCN. There's such a need for the support that the CCN can provide. We have really appreciated all of her input. She even helps doctors with questions and suggestions. Thanks to her input and knowledge on things, we even adjusted our medical care approach for the better. This disease is coming so fast. The need is only going to increase. There's just not enough hands on deck to help the way the CCN does, but I hope that changes. Um, next slide. So in the course of, we're about two years into implementation, um, we have had 1,451 contacts with individuals. We have done almost 500 screenings and we use the 88, the NTG EDSD, which is specific to those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we just started using the SLUM screening. Um, we've had 85 individuals actually come through our program and of those 29 had an IDD diagnosis. Next slide. So these are my top 10 lessons learned for you. And I've broken them out between persons living with dementia and our community and medical partnerships. So starting with our families, offer support rather than ask for needs. It's easier to see needs in person. So what I'm saying here is that if I go in and say, how can I help? That's another task that a person has to perform. They have to come up with the information. It's much easier if I say, would you like help with, or I can offer you and then fill in those blanks. We've also noticed that when we go in person, we're picking up on safety issues that we may not have over the phone or even by Zoom. Um, it's friendlier. 
people tell us more information. Now, once we've made that initial contact in person, that could easily be carried out over the phone. Important to keep things simple and short. Um, the shorter it is, the better. One of our first screenings was many pages long, and we have shortened it to 10 questions. Um, so keep that in mind as you go through that. Become the bridge between services. You want to model and repeat. You are creating an impact just by being present. I know there's several times where we say, I don't feel like I'm doing anything for this family. And then they'll come back and tell us, much like you saw in those quotes, it's really important that you are here with us. For our medical partnerships in our community, plan for short introductions and then follow up. Um, respectively hold tight to those that share your passion. Um, don't overuse them, collaborate in a way that doesn't overwhelm. Your support staff, um, to your clinic directors, your discharge planners, they're the people to reach out to. They know how to get referrals through. Um, think outside the doctor's office. We've had referrals from pharmacists, adult protective services, and especially our senior centers. And count on that word will spread as you make an impact. Next slide. I thank you for your time today, and I'll now turn it back over to Sari. Great. Thank you, Brooke and Michelle, for your presentations. Both were excellent. We have a lot of questions that have come in, which is wonderful. And um, I just, there were also, you can go to the next slide, Cameron, it's fine. Um, there are also a few questions about how these programs are funded and how much they cost people. I just want to quickly address that both of the programs you heard about are funded by the Administration for Community Living Alzheimer's Disease Programs Initiative. Um, funding announcements are on grants.gov when they are available. You can take a look at there every so often to see if there are open opportunities. Um, there's no cost to people while it, in these programs right now that we just talked about because they are being funded. Um, we're going to start just with a little bit of um, going back to the background so people are on the same playing field here. There were a few questions about the eligibility criteria for both of your programs. So, Michelle, if you could start by just laying out um, the brief eligibility criteria, and then Brooke will have you follow on after that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Sari. Um, so to be eligible for our program, the person um, living with dementia must have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. Um, there has to be a person, um, an adult, so 18 years or older, who helps them, who's willing to participate in the program. That person doesn't have to live with them, but there has to be someone else that we can connect with that's a caregiver for them. Um, either the person with the disease or the caregiver has to be living in the county that we're providing the services in. So they don't both have to be in that county, but at least one of them does. Um, the person with dementia cannot be living in a skilled nursing facility or a memory care community because part of the idea behind care ecosystem is it helps to reduce um, institutionalization or to um, kind of slow down the need for someone to be placed in, in those types of communities. So if they're already there, um, it's probably a little late for this particular program. Um, of course, our community health workers speak English and Spanish, so to be able to communicate with our community health workers, and then someone who's not already involved in a similar type of dementia care support program. Like if they're already you know, going to UCSF and participating in their care ecosystem program or another program where they're getting the, basically the same thing, um, then we feel like they're probably already covered. So, and someone asked if it was just Medi-Cal, um, and it's not, um, we serve folks um, it doesn't, income isn't one of the qualifiers. Thank you. Great, thank you. Brooke, do you wanna talk a little bit about the eligibility criteria? Sure, for our program, um, we really only have three criteria. Again, like Michelle's, we, if you are institutionalized in any way, then that's not an option. We're looking for people who are wanting to stay at home or in a family home. Um, the other is if you're having concerns that you have dementia, we don't require a diagnosis. We'll actually help you through that process. And the third one, they have to want to participate. It's a very important one. Um, we had a few questions come in about how you're serving people who live alone with dementia. I know, Michelle, you mentioned there has to be someone who's able to help them. But can you talk a little bit? We'll start with you, Brooke, this time about how you're serving people who may be living alone with dementia um, and how you connect a care partner with them or someone else to assist. So that has been one of the things that we are doing. Um, we have 
a few individuals who are living alone that they don't have an identified care partner. Um, so somehow they're referred to us usually through an agency that has said, we have concerns about this person. Um, we try to assess before going out whether they are aware that they're having issues or not, um, and then start that conversation with them. And that's part of our screening program is that we'll take out an 88 form, which is eight simple questions that ask, you know, are you having confusion? Are you finding um, problems with this? Do you have problems with thinking? Um, we'll start there and then start that conversation with them and then start developing relationships around them. Um, we'll reach out to, do they have family? Is there someone that we could contact? Is there someone aware? Sometimes it's a neighbor um, that's actually providing services for them. And so then we'll bring them into the loop and bring them in as part of the team. Great, thank you. Michelle, do you wanna to respond to that? Um, yeah, just in terms of the eligibility? No, the how you're serving people who live alone. Oh, the live alone, sorry, yes. Um, so um, we are, so I don't have the specific number, but we do have some folks who um, the caregiver is in one location and the care recipient is in another. Um, I'm guessing right now with our program that the majority of them are, um, the care person is living with the person with the disease. It's either a spouse or an adult child, but, um, or a sibling, but we do have a few I know that are, that are living alone. Okay, great, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about community outreach and marketing? How are caregivers and um, people living with dementia hearing about your care ecosystem programs and what methods have been the most successful? Brooke, do you want to start? Sure. Um, our most successful, I think, have been our senior center talks. Um, we've done the most of those. So we will go and we'll give a presentation, we'll stay and we'll hang out. We might have, you know, sit and eat lunch with everyone and develop some friendships there. Um, you don't see a turnaround right away. It happens later. Um, in addition, we have talked with area agencies and told them about what we're doing. We work to partner with them um, and remind them that we're here should they run into someone. We've even talked with law enforcement, firefighters, you know, we look at anybody who would have contact with someone and we make sure that they know how to refer to us, that they have our business card and that they know our face as well as our name. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Can you talk a little bit about the marketing and outreach? Yeah, um, it's similar to Brooks, although we're probably not, you know, as far along um, given that our program is newer, but our folks have definitely been conducting outreach to other organizations in the community to make sure they know about us. Um, and then because our program's based within the area agencies on aging or independent living centers who have the information and assistance lines for the counties, um, a lot of our initial referrals have come in from people just reaching out to the agency. So they might even not, they might not necessarily be reaching out for our specific program, but they're calling because they have Alzheimer's or their caregiver and they're looking for support. And then they get referred to our program if they meet the eligibility criteria. Um, so out of our first few um, referrals, most of them were from the Area Agency on Aging Information Assistance Line, as well as in-home supportive services. Um, our outreach to programs, um, other programs in the community got us links through that. So like someone's friend is a Meals on Wheels volunteer, and they told them about the program because they'd heard about it, as well as through the local medical center. Um, I did see there was a question around the eligibility, kind of a follow-up, and someone asked if the person could live in independent living within a community. And yes, the folks who are independent living or even assisted living qualify for the program, just not folks in memory care or skilled nursing. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about, and I know this is probably not set in stone yet, but if you have ideas on how you will sustain your program after your funding ends from ACL. That's always on people's minds. So um, Michelle, do you wanna start this time? Sure, yeah. So um, as I mentioned in the presentation, you know, we're looking at um, opportunities through Medi-Cal and Medicare, and then we'll see um, what guide funded sites um, might be in these communities as well. So, you know, where we can connect with the healthcare system, um, you know, as well as if there are other resources um, 
through, you know, work that the area agencies on aging or others are doing. Um, you know, it's it's always kind of what are all the things out there and where do we fit into the different systems and models um, and how we can incorporate this work and make sure, you know, we're training people. And so folks will have the skills there. And if the organizations want to kind of keep that going, um, you know, that's definitely something we would encourage and hope to build on across the state. Great, thank you. Brooke, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, any ideas you have for sustainability? Absolutely, so our OCCK board is committed to this program. They feel it's very important. And so they they have our backs no matter which direction we go. But at this point we have applied for guide. I saw that come up in some of the questions. And so that's one of the avenues that we're looking at where we will actually incorporate in with our um, home health team. Great, thank you. We had a question about the home meds program, Michelle. Um, someone was asking how you are implementing the home meds program. Is it in person or over the phone? And can you talk a little bit about how you got the pharmacy or the entity on board to do the reviews? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, since our program is 100%, um, you know, telephone and or Zoom based, um, we aren't doing home visits. So we're doing um, home meds um, over the phone or via Zoom, um, which I know is, is not the preferred way to do home meds, but we're we're making it work. Um, and then we um, contracted with Partners and Care Foundation for the pharmacist um, review as well. Um, so they have some pharmacists that they contract with who will provide the review if you don't have a pharmacist on your team or a local connection. Um, but you know, some people I think have worked with like pharmacy schools and, and others in the community, um, or if you have a pharmacist on your team, to help with those. Great, thank you. Brooke, can you talk a little bit about how you provide emergency respite? You mentioned it in your presentation. A little more detail on that. So right now that is um, the two cognitive care navigators out of OCCK um, within our 18 counties. If we have someone who is just completely overwhelmed, I went yesterday, um, have an individual who is shifting kind of into the next stage and it's having more behavior issues and the caregiver was completely overwhelmed. Um, so we just worked out an hour that I could come and sit with him um, while she got away for a little while. And so that's kind of how it works. Um, I know that um, my co-part here also um, has a family that she sees on a regular basis. Um, it's kind of a standing appointment for her right now until we can find someone to take on that respite time, whether they hire someone or we find funding so that they can hire someone. Um, that's our emergency mm -hmm. respite role mm -hmm. at the moment. Great. Thank you. We have time probably for one more question. Can you talk a little bit briefly about the training for your um, navigators? So the community health workers, the CCNs, um, and how long that takes to get people onboarded? Uh, Michelle, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, um, our training, I would say it was probably about two months before the folks were really kind of ready to go. And, and part of that, too, was us getting all of our systems up in place and, and running. Um, so we might have been able to shorten it a little bit if we had everything else kind of in, in place and the referral staff trained and all of that. Um, but I would say about two months. So there's care ecosystem training that's available on the website at UCSF. There's also the supplementary training that we did um, and the training that they did for their organizations. Great. And Brooke, if you want to answer real briefly and then we'll close out. It's pretty similar. Um, we do the ecosystem training online. We have standard OCCK training that they have to get through. Um, we also created a program called Being Proactive, which focuses on intellectual and developmental disabilities and dementia um, that they must go through. And that's a two hour training. So all in all, it's once they get through everything, it's probably 30 days to 60 days, depending on how quickly they can work through that on their own. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today at our National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series. Special thanks to our presenters, Brooke Bryson and Michelle Johnston for sharing their knowledge with us. Please join us for our next webinar on April 9th. We'll be focusing on how um, grantees and other organizations are sustaining dementia programs. Information on that webinar will be sent 
through email soon. In your chat, you'll see where you can contact us if you have questions about the NADRC webinar series. It, the address is nadrc-webinars at rti.org. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye.